Hi everyone, this is Robert. Welcome to The Well Told Tale. Every week we bring to life the greatest science fiction and fantasy stories ever written. The Well Told Tale is now available as both a podcast and on YouTube, as well as being available early for my patrons every week over on patreon.com. There's a link in the description if you're interested in that, or in getting access to some stories I record just for my patrons. Today we have a short story from Nathaniel Hawthorne. Nathaniel Hawthorne lived in the early to mid-19th century, mostly in New England, and his writings often reflected his life there, playing with themes of morality and religion. Best known perhaps for novels like The Scarlet Letter, he also wrote many short stories, including this one today, Rappaccini's Daughter. There's a lot to think about with this story, with its interplay of nature and science, love and obsession, life and death. The story has inspired people ever since, from comic book characters, think Poison Ivy, to rock songs and operas. There's something about this tale, this garden, these characters, that resounds deep within all who hear it. So, pull up a chair. Relax and enjoy the first part of two of Rappaccini's Daughter by Nathaniel Hawthorne. A young man named Giovanni Guasconti came very long ago from the more southern region of Italy to pursue his studies at the University of Padua. Giovanni, who had but a scanty supply of gold ducats in his pocket, took lodgings in a high and gloomy chamber of an old edifice which looked not unworthy to have been the palace of a Paduan noble, and which, in fact, exhibited over its entrance the armorial bearings of a family long since extinct. The young stranger, who was not unstudied in the great poem of his country, recollected that one of the ancestors of this family, and perhaps an occupant of this very mansion, had been pictured by Dante as a partaker of the immortal agonies of his inferno. These reminiscences and associations, together with the tendency to heartbreak natural to a young man for the first time out of his native sphere, caused Giovanni to sigh heavily as he looked around the desolate and ill-furnished apartment. "'Holy Virgin, Signor!' cried old Dame Lisabetta, who, won by the youth's remarkable beauty of person, was kindly endeavouring to give the chamber a habitable air. What a sigh that was to come out of a young man's heart. Do you find this old mansion gloomy? For the love of heaven, then, put your head out of the window, and you will see as bright sunshine as you have left in Naples. Grosconti mechanically did as the old woman advised, but could not quite agree with her that the Paduan sunshine was as cheerful as that of southern Italy. Such as it was, however, it fell upon a garden beneath the window and expanded its fostering influences on a variety of plants which seemed to have been cultivated with exceeding care. "'Does this garden belong to the house?' asked Giovanni. "'Heaven forbid, signor, unless it were fruitful of better pot-herbs than any that grow there now,' answered old Elisabetta. "'No.' That garden is cultivated by the hands of Signor Giacomo Rappaccini, the famous doctor, who, I warrant him, has been heard of as far as Naples. It is said that he distills these plants into medicines that are as potent as a charm. Oftentimes you may see the Signor Doctor at work, and perchance the Signora, his daughter too, gathering the strange flowers that grow in the garden. The old woman had now done what she could for the aspect of the chamber, and, commending the young man to the protection of the saints, took her departure. Giovanni still found no better occupation than to look down into the garden beneath his window. From its appearance, he judged it to be one of those botanic gardens which were of earlier date in Padua than elsewhere in Italy or in the world, or, not improbably, it might once have been the pleasure-place of an opulent family, for there was the ruin of a marble fountain in the centre, sculptured with rare art, but so woefully shattered that it was impossible to trace the original design from the chaos of remaining fragments. The water, however, continued to gush and sparkle into the sunbeams as cheerfully as ever. 
A little gurgling sound ascended to the young man's window and made him feel as if the fountain were an immortal spirit that sung its song unceasingly and, without heeding the vicissitudes around it, while one century embodied it in marble and another scattered the perishable garniture on the soil. All about the pool into which the water subsided grew various plants that seemed to require a plentiful supply of moisture for the nourishment of gigantic leaves, and in some instances flowers gorgeously magnificent. There was one shrub in particular, set in a marble vase in the middle of the pool, that bore a profusion of purple blossoms, each of which had the lustre and richness of a gem, and the whole together made a show so resplendent that it seemed enough to illuminate the garden, even had there been no sunshine. Every portion of the soil was peopled with plants and herbs, which, if less beautiful, still bore tokens of assiduous care, as if all had their individual virtues known to the scientific mind that fostered them. Some were placed in urns, rich with old carving, and others in common garden pots. Some crept serpent-like along the ground, or climbed on high, using whatever means of ascent was offered them. One plant had wreathed itself around a statue of Vertumnus, which was thus quite veiled and shrouded in a drapery of hanging foliage, so happily arranged that it might have served a sculptor for a study. While Giovanni stood at the window, he heard a rustling behind a screen of leaves and became aware that a person was at work in the garden. His figure soon emerged into view and showed itself to be that of no common labourer, but a tall, emaciated, sallow and sickly-looking man, dressed in a scholar's garb of black. He was beyond the middle term of life, with grey hair, a thin grey beard, and a face singularly marked with intellect and cultivation, but which could never, even in his more youthful days, have expressed much warmth of heart. Nothing could exceed the intentness with which this scientific gardener examined every shrub which grew in his path. It seemed as if he was looking into their inmost nature, making observations in regard to their creative essence, and discovering why one leaf grew in this shape and another in that, and wherefore such and such flowers differed among themselves in hue and perfume. Nevertheless, in spite of this deep intelligence on his part, there was no approach to intimacy between himself and these vegetable existences. On the contrary, he avoided their actual touch, or the direct inhaling of their odours with a caution that impressed Giovanni most disagreeably, for the man's demeanour was that of one walking among malignant influences, such as savage beasts, or deadly snakes, or evil spirits, which should he allow them one moment of licence, would wreak upon him some terrible fatality. It was strangely frightful to the young man's imagination to see this air of insecurity in a person cultivating a garden, that most simple and innocent of human toils, and which had been alike the joy and labour of the unfallen parents of the race. Was this garden, then, the Eden of the present world, and this man, with such a perception of harm in what his own hands caused to grow, was he the Adam? The distrustful gardener, while plucking away the dead leaves or pruning the too luxuriant growth of the shrubs, defended his hands with a pair of thick gloves. Nor were these his only armour. When in his walk through the garden he came to the magnificent plant that hung its purple gems beside the marble fountain, he placed a kind of mask over his face and nostrils, as if all this beauty did but conceal a deadlier malice. But finding his task still too dangerous, he drew back, removed the mask and called loudly, but in the infirm voice of a person affected with inward disease, "'Beatrice! Beatrice!' "'Here am I, my father. What would you?' cried a rich and youthful voice from the window of the opposite house, a voice as rich as a tropical sunset, and which made Giovanni, though he knew not why, think of deep hues of purple or crimson, or of perfumes heavily delectable. "'Are you in the garden?' "'Yes, Beatrice,' answered the gardener, "'and I need your help.' Soon there emerged from under a sculptured portal the figure of a young girl, 
arrayed with as much richness of taste as the most splendid of the flowers, beautiful as the day, and with a bloom so deep and vivid that one shade more would have been too much. She looked redundant with life, health and energy, all of which attributes were bound down and compressed, as it were, and girdled tensely in their luxuriance by her virgin zone. Yet Giovanni's fancy must have grown morbid while he looked down into the garden, for the impression which the fair stranger made upon him was as if here were another flower, the human sister of those vegetable ones, as beautiful as they were, more beautiful than the richest of them, but still to be touched only with a glove, nor to be approached without a mask. As Beatrice came down the garden path, it was observable that she handled and inhaled the odour of several of the plants which her father had most sedulously avoided. "'Here, Beatrice,' said the latter, "'see how many needful offices require to be done by our chief treasure. Yet, shattered as I am, my life might pay the penalty of approaching it so closely as circumstances demand. Henceforth, I fear... This plant must be consigned to your sole charge. And gladly will I undertake it, cried again the rich tones of the young lady as she bent towards the magnificent plant and opened her arms as if to embrace it. Yes, my sister, my splendour, it shall be Beatrice's task to nurse and serve thee, and thou shalt reward her with thy kisses and perfumed breath, which to her is as the breath of life. Then, with all the tenderness in her manner which was so strikingly expressed in her words, she busied herself with such attentions as the plant seemed to require, and Giovanni, at his lofty window, rubbed his eyes, and almost doubted whether it were a girl tending to her favourite flower, or one sister performing the duties of affection to another. The scene soon terminated. Whether Dr. Rappaccini had finished his labours in the garden, or that his watchful eye had caught the stranger's face, he now took his daughter's arm and retired. Night was already closing in. Oppressive exhalations seemed to proceed from the plants and steal upward past the open window, and Giovanni, closing the lattice, went to his couch and dreamed of a rich flower and beautiful girl. Flower and maiden were different and yet the same, and fraught with some strange peril in either shape. But there is an influence in the light of morning that tends to rectify whatever errors of fancy or even of judgment we may have incurred during the sun's decline, or among the shadows of the night, or in the less wholesome glow of moonshine. Giovanni's first movement, on starting from sleep, was to throw open the window and gaze down into the garden which his dreams had made so fertile of mysteries. He was surprised and a little ashamed to find how real and matter-of-fact an affair it proved to be, in the first rays of the sun which gilded the dewdrops which hung upon leaf and blossom, and while giving a brighter beauty to each rare flower, brought everything within the limits of ordinary experience. The young man rejoiced that, in the heart of the barren city, he had the privilege of overlooking this spot of lovely and luxuriant vegetation. It would serve, he said to himself, as a symbolic language to keep him in communion with nature. Neither the sickly and thought-worn Dr. Giacomo Rappaccini, it is true, nor his brilliant daughter were now visible so that Giovanni could not determine how much of the singularity which he attributed to both was due to their own qualities, and how much to his wonder-working fancy, but he was inclined to take a most rational view of the whole matter. In the course of the day, he paid his respects to Signor Pietro Baglioni, professor of medicine at the university, a physician of eminent repute to whom Giovanni had brought a letter of introduction. The professor was an elderly personage, apparently of genial nature, and habits that might almost be called jovial. He kept the young man to dinner, and made him very agreeable by the freedom and liveliness of his conversation, especially when warmed by a flask or two of Tuscan wine. Giovanni, conceiving that men of science, inhabitants of the same city, must needs be on familiar terms with one another, took an opportunity to mention the name of Dr. Rappaccini.
But the professor did not respond with so much cordiality as he had anticipated. Ill would it become a teacher of the divine art of medicine, said Professor Pietro Baglioni, in answer to a question of Giovanni, to withhold due and well-considered praise of a physician so eminently skilled as Rappaccini. But, on the other hand, I should answer it but scantily to my conscience, were I to permit a worthy youth like yourself, Signor Giovanni, the son of an ancient friend, to imbibe the erroneous ideas respecting a man who might hereafter chance to hold your life and death in his hands. The truth is, our worshipful Dr. Rappaccini has as much science as any member of the faculty, with perhaps one single exception, in Padua or all Italy. But there are certain grave objections to his professional character. And what are they? asked the young man. Has my friend Giovanni any disease of body or heart that he is so inquisitive about physicians? said the professor with a smile. But as for Rappaccini, it is said of him and I, who know the man well, can answer for its truth, that he cares infinitely more for science than for mankind. His patients are interesting to him only as subjects for some new experiment. He would sacrifice human life, his own among the rest, or whatever else was dearest to him, for the sake of adding so much as a grain of mustard seed to the great heap of his accumulated knowledge. Methinks he is an awful man indeed, remarked Guasconti, mentally recalling the cold and purely intellectual aspect of Rappaccini. And yet, worshipful professor, is it not a noble spirit? Are there many men capable of so spiritual a love of science? God forbid, answered the professor somewhat testily. At least, unless they take sounder views of the healing art than those adopted by Rappaccini. It is his theory that all medicinal virtues are comprised within those substances which we term vegetable poisons. These he cultivates with his own hands, and is said even to have produced new varieties of poison. That the Signor Doctor does less mischief than might be expected with such dangerous substances is undeniable. Now and then, it must be known, he has effected, or seemed to effect, a marvellous cure. But to tell you my private mind, Signor Giovanni, he should receive little credit for such instances of success, they being probably the work of chance, but should be held strictly accountable for his failures, which may justly be considered his own work. The youth might have taken Baglioni's opinions with many grains of allowance had he known that there was a professional warfare of long continuance between him and Dr. Rappaccini, in which the latter was generally thought to have gained the advantage. If the reader be inclined to judge for himself, we refer him to certain black-letter tracts on both sides preserved in the medical department of the University of Padua. I know not, most learned professor, returned Giovanni, after musing on what had been said of Rappuccino's excessive zeal for silence, I know not how dearly this physician may love his art, but surely there is one object more dear to him. He has a daughter. Aha! cried the professor with a laugh. So, now our friend Giovanni's secret is out. You have heard of this daughter, whom all the young men in Padua are wild about, though not half a dozen have ever had the good hap to see her face. I know little of the Signora Beatrice, save that Rappaccini is said to have instructed her deeply in his science, and that, young and beautiful as fame reports her, she is already qualified to fill a professor's chair. Perchance her father destines her for mine. Other absurd rumours there be not worth talking about or listening to. So now, Signor Giovanni, drink up your glass. Cosconti returned to his lodging, somewhat heated with the wine he had quaffed, and which caused his brain to swim with strange fantasies in reference to Dr. Rappaccini and the beautiful Beatrice. 
On his way, happening to pass by a florist, he bought a fresh bouquet of flowers. Ascending to his chamber, he seated himself near the window, but within the shadow thrown by the depth of the wall, so that he could look down into the garden with little risk of being discovered. All beneath his eye was a solitude. Strange plants were basking in the sunshine, and now and then nodding gently to one another, as if in acknowledgement of sympathy and kindred. In the midst, by the shattered fountain, grew the magnificent shrub with its purple gems clustering all over it. They glowed in the air and gleamed back again out of the depths of the pool, which thus seemed to overflow with coloured radiance from the rich reflection that was steeped in it. At first, as we have said, the garden was a solitude. Soon, however, as Giovanni had half hoped, half feared would be the case, a figure appeared beneath the antique sculptured portal and came down between the rows of plants, inhaling their various perfumes, as if she were one of those beings of old classic fable that lived upon sweet odours. On again beholding Beatrice, the young man was even startled to perceive how much her beauty exceeded his recollection of it. So brilliant, so vivid was its character that she glowed amid the sunlight, and, as Giovanni whispered to himself, positively illuminated the more shadowy intervals of the garden path. Her face being now more revealed than on the former occasion, he was struck by its expression of simplicity and sweetness, qualities that had not entered into his idea of her character, and which made him ask anew what manner of mortal she might be. Nor did she fail again to observe, or imagine, an analogy between the beautiful girl and the gorgeous shrub that hung its gem-like flowers over the fountain, a resemblance which Beatrice seems to have indulged a fantastic humour in heightening, both by the arrangement of her dress and the selection of its hues. Approaching the shrub, she threw open her arms, as with a passionate ardour, and drew its branches into an intimate embrace, so intimate that her features were hidden in its leafy bosom, and her glistening ringlets all intermingled with the flowers. "'Give me thy breath, my sister,' exclaimed Beatrice, "'for I am faint with common air, and give me this flower of thine, which I separate with gentlest fingers from the stem, and place it close beside my heart.' With these words, the beautiful daughter of Rappuccini plucked one of the richest blossoms of the shrub and was about to fasten it in her bosom. But now, unless Giovanni's draughts of wine had bewildered his senses, a singular incident occurred. A small orange-coloured reptile of the lizard or chameleon species chanced to be creeping along the path just at the feet of Beatrice. It appeared to Giovanni, but at the distance from which he gazed, he could scarcely have seen anything so minute. It appeared to him, however, that a drop or two of moisture from the broken stem of the flower descended upon the lizard's head. For an instant, the reptile contorted itself violently and then lay motionless in the sunshine. Beatrice observed this remarkable phenomenon and crossed herself sadly, but without surprise, nor did she therefore hesitate to arrange the fatal flower in her bosom. There it blushed, and almost glimmered with the dazzling effect of a precious stone, adding to her dress and aspect the one appropriate charm which nothing else in the world could have supplied. But Giovanni, out of the shadow of his window, bent forward and shrank back, and murmured and trembled. "'Am I awake? Have I my senses?' he said to himself. "'What is this being? Beautiful, shall I call her, or inexpressibly terrible?' Beatrice now strayed carelessly through the garden, approaching closer beneath Giovanni's window, so that he was compelled to thrust his head quite out of its concealment in order to gratify the intense and painful curiosity which she excited. At this moment there came a beautiful insect over the garden wall. It had perhaps wandered through the city and found no flowers or verdure among those antique haunts of men, until the heady perfumes of Dr. Rappuccini's shrubs had lured it from afar. Without alighting on the flowers, this winged brightness seemed to be attracted by Beatrice, and lingered in the air and fluttered about her head. Now, here it could not be, but Giovanni Grisconti's eyes deceived him. 
be that as it might, he fancied that, while Beatrice was gazing at the insect with childish delight, it grew faint and fell at her feet, its bright wings shivered. It was dead, from no cause that he could discern unless it were the atmosphere of her breath. Again Beatrice crossed herself and sighed heavily as she bent over the dead insect. An impulsive movement of Giovanni drew her eyes to the window. There she beheld the beautiful head of the young man, rather a Grecian than an Italian head, with fair, regular features and a glistening of gold among his ringlets, gazing down upon her like a being that hovered in mid-air. Scarcely knowing what he did, Giovanni threw down the bouquet which he had hitherto held in his hand. Signora, said he, there are beautiful and healthful flowers. Wear them for the sake of Giovanni Gosconti. Thanks, signor, replied Beatrice with her rich voice that came forth as if it were like a gush of music, and with a mirthful expression half childish and half womanlike, I accept your gift, and would fain recompense it with this precious purple flower, but if I toss it into the air it will not reach you, so signor Gasconti must even content himself with my thanks. She lifted the bouquet from the ground, and then, as if inwardly ashamed at having stepped aside from her maidenly reserve to respond to a stranger's greeting, passed swiftly homeward through the garden. But few as the moments were, it seemed to Giovanni, when she was on the point of vanishing beneath the sculptured portal, that his beautiful bouquet was already beginning to wither in her grasp. It was an idle thought. There could be no possibility of distinguishing a faded flower from a fresh one at so great a distance. For many days after this incident, the young man avoided the window that looked into Dr. Rappuccini's garden, as if something ugly and monstrous would have blasted his eyesight, had he been betrayed into a glance. He felt conscious of having put himself, to a certain extent, within the influence of an unintelligible power by the communication which he had opened with Beatrice. The wisest course would have been, if his heart were in any real danger, to quit his lodgings and Padua itself at once. The next wiser, to have accustomed himself as far as possible to the familiar and daylight view of Beatrice, thus bringing her rigidly and systematically within the limits of ordinary experience. Least of all, while avoiding her sight, ought Giovanni to have remained so near this extraordinary being that the proximity and possibility even of intercourse should give a kind of substance and reality to the wild vagaries which his imagination ran riot continually in producing. Gusconti had not a deep heart, or at all events its depths were not sounded now, but he had a quick fancy and an ardent southern temperament which rose every instant to a higher fever pitch. Whether or no Beatrice possessed those terrible attributes, that fatal breath, the affinity with those so beautiful and deadly flowers, which were indicated by what Giovanni had witnessed, she had at least instilled a fierce and subtle poison into his system. It was not love, although her rich beauty was a madness to him, nor horror, even while he fancied her spirit to be imbued with the same baneful essence that seemed to pervade her physical frame, but a wild offspring of both love and horror that had each parent in it, and burned like one and shivered like the other. Giovanni knew not what to dread, still less did he know what to hope, yet hope and dread kept a continual warfare in his breast, alternately vanquishing one another and starting up afresh to renew the contest. Blessed are all simple emotions, be they dark or bright. It is the lurid intermixture of the two that produces the illuminating blaze of the infernal regions. Sometimes he endeavoured to assuage the fever of his spirit by a rapid walk through the streets of Padua or beyond its gates. His footsteps kept time with the throbbings of his brain so that the walk was apt to accelerate itself to a race. One day he found himself arrested. His arm was seized by a portly personage who had turned back on recognising the young man and expended much breath in overtaking him. 
"'Signor Giovanni, stay, my young friend,' cried he. "'Have you forgotten me? "'That might well be the case if I were as much altered as yourself.' "'It was Baglioni, whom Giovanni had avoided ever since their first meeting, "'from a doubt that the professor's sagacity would look too deeply into his secrets. "'Endeavouring to recover himself, he stared forth wildly from his inner world into the outer one, "'and spoke like a man in a dream. "'Yes, I am, Giovanni Guasconti. You are Professor Pietro Baglioni. "'Now, let me pass.' "'Not yet, not yet, Signor Giovanni Guasconti,' said the professor, smiling, "'but at the same time scrutinising the youth with an earnest glance. "'What?' Did I grow up side by side with your father, and shall his son pass me like a stranger in these old streets of Padua? Stand still, Signor Giovanni, for we must have a word or two before we part. Speedily, then, most worshipful professor, speedily, said Giovanni with feverish impatience. Does not your worship see that I am in haste? Now, while he was speaking, there came a man in black along the street, stooping and moving feebly like a person in inferior health. His face was all overspread with a most sickly and sallow hue, but yet so pervaded with an expression of piercing and active intellect that an observer might easily have overlooked the merely physical attributes and have only seen this wonderful energy. As he passed, this person exchanged a cold and distant salutation with Baglioni, but fixed his eyes upon Giovanni with an intentness that seemed to bring out whatever was within him worthy of notice. Nevertheless, there was a peculiar quietness in the look, as if taking merely a speculative, not a human interest in the young man. "'It is Dr. Rappuccini,' whispered the professor when the stranger had passed, "'Has he seen your face before?' "'Not that I know,' answered Giovanni, starting at the name. "'He has seen you. "'He must have seen you,' said Baglioni hastily. "'For some purpose or other, this man of science is making a study of you. "'I know that look of his. "'It is the same that coldly illuminates his face as he bends over a bird, or "'a mouse or a butterfly, which in pursuance of some experiment... He has killed by the perfume of a flower, a look as deep as nature itself, but without nature's warmth of love. Signor Giovanni, I will stake my life upon it. You are the subject of one of Rappuccini's experiments. Will you make a fool of me? cried Giovanni passionately. That, Signor Professor, were an untoward experiment. Patience, patience, replied the imperturbable professor. I tell thee, my poor Giovanni, that Rappuccini has a scientific interest in thee. Thou hast fallen into fearful hands, and the Signora Beatrice. What part does she play in this mystery? But Guasconti, finding Baglioni's pertinacity intolerable, here broke away, and was gone before the professor could again seize his arm. He looked after the young man intently, and shook his head. "'This must not be,' said Baglioni to himself. "'The youth is the son of my old friend, and shall not come to any harm from which the arcana of medical science can preserve him. Besides—' It is too insufferable an impertinence in Rappuccini thus to snatch the lad out of my own hands, as I may say, and make use of him for his infernal experiments. This daughter of his, it shall be looked to. Perchance, most learned Rappuccini, I may foil you where you little dream of it. Meanwhile, Giovanni had pursued a circuitous route, and at length found himself at the door of his lodgings. As he crossed the threshold, he was met by old Lisabetta, who smirked and smiled, and was evidently desirous to attract his attention. Vainly, however, as the ebullition of his feelings had momentarily subsided into a cold and dull vacuity. He turned his eyes full upon the withered face that was puckering itself into a smile, but seemed to behold it not. The old dame, therefore, laid her grasp upon his cloak. 
Signor, Signor, whispered she, still with a smile over the whole breadth of her visage, so that it looked not unlike a grotesque carving in wood darkened by centuries. Listen, Signor, there is a private entrance into the garden. What did you say? exclaimed Giovanni, turning quickly about as if an inanimate thing should start into feverish life. A private entrance into Dr. Rappuccini's garden. Hush, hush, not so loud, whispered Lisabetta, putting her hand over his mouth. Yes, into the worshipful doctor's garden, where you may see all his fine shrubbery. Many a young man in Padua would give gold to be admitted among those flowers. Giovanni put a piece of gold into her hand. Show me the way, said he. A surmise, probably excited by his conversation with Baglioni, crossed his mind that this interposition of old Lisabetta might perchance be connected with the intrigue, whatever were its nature, in which the professor seemed to suppose that Dr. Rappuccini was involving him. But such a suspicion, though it disturbed Giovanni, was inadequate to restrain him. The instant that he was aware of the possibility of approaching Beatrice, it seemed an absolute necessity of his existence to do so. It mattered not whether she were an angel or a demon. He was irrevocably within her sphere, and must obey the law that whirled him onward in ever-lessening circles towards a result which she did not attempt to foreshadow. And yet, strange to say, there came across him a sudden doubt whether this intense interest on his part were not delusory, whether it were really of so deep and positive a nature as to justify him in now thrusting himself into an incalculable position, whether it were not merely the fantasy of a young man's brain, only slightly or not at all connected with his heart. He paused hesitated, turned half about, but again went on. His withered guide led him along several obscure passages, and finally undid a door, through which, as it were opened, there came the sight and sound of rustling leaves, with the broken sunshine glimmering among them. Giovanni stepped forth, and forcing himself through the entanglement of a shrub that wreathed its tendrils over the hidden entrance, stood beneath his own window in the open area of Dr. Rappuccini's garden. How often it is that the case that when impossibilities have come to pass and dreams have condensed their misty substance into tangible realities, we find ourselves calm and even coldly self-possessed amid circumstances which it would have been a delirium of joy or agony to anticipate. Fate delights to thwart us thus. Passion will choose his own time to rush upon the scene, and lingers sluggishly behind when an appropriate adjustment of events would seem to summon his appearance. So it was now with Giovanni. Day after day his pulses had throbbed with feverish blood at the improbable idea of an interview with Beatrice, and of standing with her face to face in this very garden, basking in the oriental sunshine of her beauty, and snatching from her full gaze the mystery which he deemed the riddle of his own existence. But now there was a singular and untimely equanimity within his breast. He threw a glance around the garden to discover if Beatrice or her father were present, and perceiving that he was alone, began a critical observation of the plants. The aspect of one and all of them dissatisfied him. Their gorgeousness seemed fierce, passionate, and even unnatural. There was hardly an individual shrub which a wanderer, straying by himself through a forest, would not have been startled to find growing wild, as if an unearthly face had glared at him out of the thicket. Several also would have shocked a delicate instinct by an appearance of artificialness, indicating that there had been such commixture and, as it were, adultery of various vegetable species, that the production was no longer of God's making, but the monstrous offspring of man's depraved fancy, glowing only with an evil mockery of beauty. They were probably the result of experiment, which, in one or two cases, had succeeded in mingling plants individually lovely into a compound possessing the questionable and ominous character that distinguished the whole growth of the garden. In fine, 
Giovanni recognised but two or three plants in the collection, and those of a kind that he knew well to be poisonous. While busy with these contemplations, he heard the rustling of a silken garment, and, turning, beheld Beatrice emerging from beneath the sculptured portal. Giovanni had not considered with himself what should be his deportment, whether he should apologise for his intrusion into the garden, or assume that he was there with the privity at least, if not the desire, of Dr. Rappuccini or his daughter, but Beatrice's manner placed him at his ease, though leaving him still in doubt by what agency he had gained admittance. She came lightly along the path and met him near the broken fountain. There was surprise in her face, but brightened by a simple and kind expression of pleasure. "'You were a connoisseur of flowers, signor,' said Beatrice with a smile, alluding to the bouquet which he had flung from her window. "'It is no marvel, therefore, if the sight of my father's rare collection has tempted you to take a nearer view. If he were here, he could tell you many strange and interesting facts as to their nature and the habits of these shrubs, for he has spent a lifetime in such studies, and this garden is his world.' "'And yourself, lady?' observed Giovanni. If fame says true, you likewise are deeply skilled in the virtues indicated by these rich blossoms and these spicy perfumes. Would you deign to be my instructress, I should prove an apter scholar than if taught by Signor Rappuccini himself. Are there such idle rumours? asked Beatrice, with the music of a pleasant laugh. Do people say that I am skilled in my father's science of plants? What a jest is there! No, I have grown up among these flowers. I know no more of them than their hues and perfume, and sometimes, methinks, I would fain rid myself of even that small knowledge. There are many flowers here, and those not the least brilliant, that shock and offend me when they meet my eye. But pray, signor, do not believe those stories about my science. Believe nothing of me, save what you see with your own eyes." "'And must I believe all that I have seen with my own eyes?' asked Giovanni pointedly, while the recollection of former scenes made him shrink. "'No, Signora, you demand too little of me. Bid me believe nothing save what comes from your own lips.' It would appear that Beatrice understood him. There came a deep flush to her cheek, but she looked full into Giovanni's eyes and responded to his gaze of uneasy suspicion with a queen-like haughtiness. "'I do so bid you, signor,' she replied. "'Forget whatever you may have fancied in regard to me. If true to the outward senses, still it may be false in its essence.' But the words of Beatrice Rappuccini's lips are true from the depths of the heart outwards, those you may believe. A fervour glowed in her whole aspect, and beamed upon Giovanni's consciousness like the light of truth itself, but while she spoke there was a fragrance in the atmosphere around her, rich and delightful, though evanescent, yet which the young man, from an indefinable reluctance, scarcely dared to draw into his lungs. It might be the odour of the flowers. Could it be Beatrice's breath, which thus embalmed her words with a strange richness, as if by steeping them in her heart? A faintness passed like a shadow over Giovanni and flitted away. He seemed to gaze through the beautiful girl's eyes into her transparent soul, and felt no more doubt or fear. The tinge of passion that had coloured Beatrice's manner vanished. She became gay, and appeared to derive a pure delight from her communion with the youth, not unlike what the maiden of a lonely island might have felt conversing with a voyager from the civilised world. Evidently, her experience of life had been confined within the limits of that garden. She talked now about matters as simple as the daylight or summer clouds, and now asked questions in reference to the city or Giovanni's distant home, his friends, his mother and his sisters. Questions indicating such seclusion and such lack of familiarity with modes and forms that Giovanni responded as if to an infant. Her spirit 
gushed out before him like a fresh rill that was just catching its first glimpse of the sunlight and wondering at the reflections of earth and sky which were flung into its bosom. There came thoughts, too, from a deep source, and fantasies of a gem-like brilliancy, as if diamonds and rubies sparkled upward among the bubbles of the fountain. Ever and anon there gleamed across the young man's mind a sense of wonder that he should be walking side by side with the being who had so wrought upon his imagination, whom he had idealised in such shoes of terror, in whom he had positively witnessed such manifestations of dreadful attributes, that he should be conversing with Beatrice like a brother, and should find her so human and maidenlike. But such reflections were only momentary. The effect of her character was too real not to make itself familiar at once. In this free intercourse they had strayed through the garden, and now, after many turns among its avenues, were coming to the shattered fountain, beside which grew the magnificent shrub with its treasury of glowing blossoms. A fragrance was diffused from it which Giovanni recognised as identical with that which he had attributed to Beatrice's breath, but incomparably more powerful. As her eyes fell upon it, Giovanni beheld her press her hand to her bosom as if her heart were throbbing suddenly and painfully. "'For the first time in my life,' murmured she, addressing the shrub, "'I had forgotten thee.' "'I remember, Signora,' said Giovanni, "'that you once promised to reward me with one of these living gems "'for the bouquet which I had the happy boldness to fling to your feet.' Permit me now to pluck it as a memorial of this interview. He made a step towards the shrub with an extended hand, but Beatrice darted forward, uttering a shriek that went through his heart like a dagger. She caught his hand and drew it back with the whole force of her slender figure. Giovanni felt her touch thrilling through his fibres. Touch it not, exclaimed she in a voice of agony, not for thy life. It is fatal. Then, hiding her face, she fled from him and vanished beneath the sculptured portal. As Giovanni followed her with his eyes, he beheld the emaciated figure and pale intelligence of Dr. Rabaccini, who had been watching the scene, he knew not how long, within the shadow of the entrance. And welcome back. I hope you enjoyed this first part of Rappuccini's Daughter by Nathaniel Hawthorne. I am passionate about sharing these classic science fiction and fantasy stories with as wide an audience as possible, and free for everyone. So please do recommend The Well-Told Tale to a friend if you think they'd be interested. Or if you'd like to support the channel, or get access to some stories I record exclusively for my patrons, please do consider visiting patreon.com slash thewelltoldtale. There's a link in the description. That's all for this time. I'll be back next week with the second and final part of this story. I hope you can join me. <laughs>